Okay, I'll start. So, glad to be here. I'm Jason Ross, and I wanted to follow up on some of the topics that have been coming up a lot already, um, both about artificial intelligence and machine learning, and then the question about intelligence, intelligence, or natural intelligence, <laughs> organic intelligence, um, non-GMO intelligence, you know, whatever you want to call it, human intelligence creativity and what that really is by getting into some examples of it because it's really you know there's a lot of things it's really hard to talk about music without playing some music it's hard to talk about art without having some art and it's pretty hard to talk about discovery and science without having some specific examples so I think I think this will be helpful so uh, I'm just gonna jump right into machine learning say what that is a little bit about how it works and we can compare the way machines learn to how we do and see see if there's any differences so, um, you've, has any, is it the word machine learning, is that something, that, is that a familiar term, or? Okay, every time you hear artificial intelligence, what they really mean is machine learning, because uh, most people don't claim it's really intelligent yet. So, it's how Netflix gets you to keep watching things, it's the way Amazon robots kind of figure out on their own where to move stacks of things for people to pick. Uh, it's things where it's a different paradigm for the way computers work where initially you had to tell the computer everything and it would do what it was told and now there's a lot of tasks where it's just way more efficient to give only a general hint to things and let the computer figure out so to speak the details on its own so figuring out how do we get people to keep watching YouTube or something like that human beings didn't figure all of that out they sort of take a bunch of data and the computer figures it out and they couldn't even explain it if they wanted to afterwards. One of the big ways that these things operate now is with neural networks. Does anybody see anything familiar in this term? Is this a common term? It's like neural pathways in the brain. Neural, what's that word mean? Yeah, it's the adjective of a neuron. And neurons are the cells in our nervous system that do all their nerving. So here's the, the pieces of it. Here's a neuron, a nerve cell. It's got a body, you know, to do all the cell stuff, like make energy and those kinds of things. And then the computer analogy on this is that there's inputs called dendrites, and there's an output called the axon. So these cells end up hooking up to each other where the axons, the, the outputs of a bunch of other cells come into one nerve cell. So you end up with a network where maybe 10 nerve axons are touching some of the dendrites on this cell. Depending on whether these axons are doing their thing and firing, meaning releasing some chemicals that then come to the dendrons, those chemical, those signals could cause the cell to fire or they could actually inhibit it from firing. And that's just some of like the basic biology about this. It's really oversimplified to say that it's just the nerve is on or off. It's not exactly that simple. And there's also a lot more to this in terms of you know, hormones, other chemicals floating around. But people trying to think about how a computer could be more human use this really simplified idea of inputs coming into a cell and then depending on how it's configured maybe the cell will shoot a signal to the next one. So this is, uh, let's take a look at a bigger one. Let's take a look at an example of this. What you got here is, this is the, what we're gonna train this neural network with, so to speak. There's blue things in the middle, there's orange things around it. We're just gonna give this thing data and figure and see if it can figure out a formula to accurately be able to say if you you know point at a certain spot whether it should be blue or orange. So let's just take a look at what this thing does right out of the box here. There it is. Okay. Okay, so that, that went pretty quick. Why don't we slow that down? So 
here, the kind of shading is the current state of the network. And over time, after, you know, after doing a thousand improvements, it's now pretty good at essentially creating a formula all on its own that got the gestalt. It looks like it got the gestalt of blue in the middle and orange on the outside. Here's how the neurons work on this. What it starts with is two inputs that are just basically what's the horizontal location and the second one is what's the vertical location. Yeah. So the two, the initial inputs, these would be something akin to like our sensory organs. One of them is just the horizontal location. The second input is the vertical location. There are then four neurons that, that take as inputs what's the horizontal location and what's the vertical location. To take this one here, now let's take a look at this one. It's partially taking the horizontal location. It's partly taking the vertical location. And the result of taking both is that it's sort of seeing a diagonal, amount of diagonal motion, so to speak. I'm going for a kind of a very rough understanding of all this also. So, you know, just don't, don't worry if it doesn't all totally make sense. These neurons then connect to other neurons. So this one's really thick. This is where most of the, the calculations taking place here. It's using these two positively, this one negatively, and when you put it together, it's now got basically something like a formula inside itself where just the horizontal and vertical location has now become a function that looks like what we're going to end up wanting. In this case, inverted, but let's not worry about that. Because um, then it gets... Then it gets inverted again at the end to... forgot to turn power save off. Um, to make the, the final thing. So, the point in bringing this up was that it sort of figured out how to have the neurons work to make that occur. Let's just watch it sort of do its learning again here. And then talk about how it changes over time. And just to point out, this is a thick blue line. These are both pretty thick and blue. Last time, this was orange. This one was orange. It figured out in a different way how to get a similar result in the end. Just to run it one more time. Now it's orange ones on the top. Okay. Still eventually, you know, it gets to where it's going. This is almost like magic. And people who work with this stuff are actually amazed at if you add in enough neurons and then layers of layers of neurons that sort of pass it down and down the chain, that you can get something where the input is, let's say, all of the pixels in an image. The color, the brightness. And the output is, this is a dog. This is a cat. This is a lizard. This is an apple. That's how those things like Google Image Search works. It sees images. Some of it, it does the text on the page, but sometimes it just figures out, hey, this is a picture of an apple. So maybe if someone searches for apple, I'll show them this thing. Um, so two things to point out. One is that you had to give it something to start with to teach it. And then it kind of does the rest. So. Uh, Okay, so that's a... But this is all in little squares, right? Yeah, each of those little squares is, is called a neuron. And each one acts like a... Each one acts like one of the neurons in the, in the brain. Here's how. So this neuron, there's these four lines going into it. Those are like the axons from these four neurons. 
they all come in here, they interact with, inter um, interact with its dendrites, and then the cell decides whether to fire or not. The thicknesses of these lines is how this cell's dendrites relate to the axons, the outputs from the previous one. These are, it's blue, slight orange, blue and blue. Blue is positive. So if these things are firing, this one will be more likely to fire. The inputs here are orange. If these are firing, this one's less likely to fire. But then when it goes to the output, it ends up flipping it again. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> so the question then would be, how did this thing learn? How did it get better over time? So the way it learns is seen in this, um, this little curve up at the top here. Let's watch that as it, as it evolves over time. Oh. As it's getting better, the curve's going down the error is decreasing. This entire thing is based off of reducing the error. In this case, it's able to know whether it's an error or not, because we told it, hey, these, all these dots, these are example blue ones, these are example orange ones, figure out how to make that happen. The way it does it is it, it, it makes a hypothesis, so to speak. It creates colors. It looks at how wrong it is, and then it looks at if I adjusted this one slightly, how could I improve it? Let me adjust it a little bit in that direction. If this one was slightly changed, which way should I change it? Should I make it more orange or more blue? Okay, and then make a tiny portion of that change. Once you change those, you step back. And now you say, okay, these neurons have got their inputs. Now, how do we improve... I'm sorry. How do we improve this one now? We're going to adjust each of these four inputs to it, how blue or orange it is, and these ones. And then we adjust these ones. So it's called backwards propagation. You go back, you make tiny adjustments, you run through it again forwards to see what that creates. Then you run backwards to slightly improve it, and you run forwards again. And you just keep doing this again and again and again. And that's, that's what it's counting here with this uh, epoch number. So, uh, let me ask then, um, we talk about backward propagation. I'll just show a picture of this. Uh, yeah, let's not worry about it. But you can, have many, you can have many layers of these neurons. And this is a way more complicated thing. It's trying to figure out how to make its gestalt of. So, what do you think? Is this like the way that we come up with ideas? Is it different? music or you're learning how to sing or play an instrument you build branches in your brain over time through repetitive practice and discipline so that your brain can use those same neuron pathways that are already there okay. for skills to me it doesn't really seem like it is similar because this seems to just take things from the past or just different data sets and uh, come up with answers or whatever you want to say based off of that well and it doesn't really ever create anything new and it doesn't seem like it's actually really synthesizing anything new but just an amalgam amalgamation of, of prior data well wait, wait what do you mean by new though sorry uh, Mike. Point at random too. 
Are we find a different path each time to, to get there? I mean, it's completely, um, you know, unintelligent. <laughs> unintelligent? Yeah. Lainey, do you want to say something? Yeah, I can't be figured out how these robots, the artificial robots, how they can make a brush of straw. They definitely do make things that look like brush of straw. Um, I don't know if I can say how they do it. I guess we could learn like that, the way the neural networks work, but can we learn another way? Hmm. Jason? Oh. Hmm? Uh, I don't know why we're all assuming, though. We know how the human brain works. <laughs> that's, that's my thing. Like, I'm over here trying to make oh, assumptions. I, I didn't bring up the brain. Oh, I did. You did. Okay. Whoops. <laughs> so, okay. did you mean to say mind? I or meant to put mind. Well, no, actually, I did mean brain, and then I was going to talk about the mind. But, okay, so you were going to talk about it. Um, Let's focus on our experience with our own minds, because I don't know, maybe we don't really have much about our brains. Uh, so, so, Richard and Frank and the native. I mean, I always thought of an insight as, as a jump. Hmm. It's like it comes from nowhere. But when you get an insight, you're not quite sure where it came from. But it's not a, a, an amalgam of a bunch of impressions. Something clicks, uh -huh. and then everything is redefined by something, even if it's a small insight. You say, aha! That doesn't seem to be in that schema that you have. Mm. No flash. No flash. Yeah. No eureka. might come up with like, oh, okay, hot dogs always have green backgrounds, or like hot dogs are this much height by width or something. And I don't think a human would make that mistake. Like, uh -huh. I think it can, I, mean, no, I, I don't think it, it, it can like abstract and understand like this is, a, this is an object, like this is a representation of an object. Like, it's just sort of like blunt forcing its way mm. to mimic some uh, understanding that it just is natural for us, but we take the brain. You're right. Like if all if we trained it, if all the pictures of hot dogs we showed it had a green background, yeah. it's gonna it wouldn't recognize a hot dog on a white plate. <laughs> or if they all had mustard, and then we show a picture of a hot dog with ketchup, it's like, yeah. hey, I don't know what this is. Kind of like you know the way kids have to be shown one million hot dogs before they know what a hot dog is. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly the same. <laughs> well, the, the ending point is hollow in that sense because it, it's. Um, it doesn't have a gestalt, that's what I'm saying. It does not have any understanding, it just has um, um, a shadow of it, you mm -hmm. know, an outline of what could be. And the starting point is hollow because it needs to be told what's good. Yeah. And human beings don't need, need that, necessarily. Well, like one example might be Netflix where it's, it's measure of whether it's doing a good job of recommending things is if you keep watching, or YouTube. So that would be another thing, where if you, know, you say, okay, here's what's good, is people spending all day on YouTube. Now, is that really a good thing? Or not? <laughs> you know, who like, asked? Like, but then if you ask it, okay, why do people like this video, why do they like this one? You can't get anything out of it. You can't actually learn anything to put into words. So if somebody says, why was I denied bail? says, I have no idea. That's just what the number was that came out. You have to stay in jail until you're at your trial. You can't put it in jail. Thank you. Okay.
So definitely some differences. I, well, I'm going to come back to this flash of, of insight thing, because a great idea isn't like 1,000 tiny steps that's slightly... I, how does that even work? Is an idea made of... How many pieces make up a new idea that you've had? Well, think of... Um, you brought up some ideas about, um, these aren't maybe the most profound ideas, but you brought up some ideas about uh, El Salvador and Bukele today. Yes. Let's switch to the more profound one. How about, uh, you know, the, the questions that were put to, to Helga about nonviolence or love or, you know, these kinds of things. Did those ideas, think about just, maybe we'll, let's not answer, but let's think about it. How many components, how many pieces those ideas were made out of? In other words, were those thoughts a bunch of Lego blocks put together? How many? Is an idea complex or simple? So, if we think about what drives discovery, well, what drives human discovery? What, we, we've talked about this a little bit between yesterday and today. What, where does a discovery come from? Necessity. Necessity, okay. Irony. An irony, okay. Fun. Wow. All right. Necessary ironic fun. Necessary ironic fun. <laughs> Something out of the ordinary. Okay. Okay. So I want to take an example now of applying this stuff to art. So these are some uh, drawings and sketches by anyone recognize who these are by? Leonardo da Vinci. That's right. How about these ones? Who did those? Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. If you were sitting far away, you would think it's da Vinci. That's a good answer. If you were sitting far away, it would look like da Vinci. Yes. I'll zoom in on one. In fact, like in fact, this is a movie that Leonardo da Vinci made. It's like they, it's like they, they remixed it. Huh? So I don't know if there's any of those frames that really spoke to you. And if they did, I don't know, I want to know what they said, if they did. Because um, like, okay, like... Here there's clearly, there's, like, there's something specific that this is a drawing of, right? <laughs> That's important. On the lower right is a, a, prepar a sketch in preparation for doing a painting. Here we have some studies of embryology. Yes, this is machine learning Leonardo da Vinci art, as the blog said. And who am I to judge? And who are you to judge? So this is art. <laughs> um, This is, yes, these are, this is like the sort of thing where you say, hey, I would like a Leonardo da Vinci drawing. You know, there's, there's better ones where you could say, I would like a drawing of the space shuttle if Leonardo da Vinci drew it. And like, it's like a Photoshop filter or something. It'll sort of look like that. But this is supposedly some, just some new, some new art. So there's not, it doesn't, there's, it's not a picture of anything, really. It's pieces reassembled where from a distance it has that feel of da Vinci, but there's nothing there. So, uh, anybody recognize this painting? Yeah. Who's, who did painted this? Rembrandt. It's Rembrandt. And what's going on? I want somebody to answer. I don't want to hug a, hug a okay, well then just hold on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think I see that a man is sitting down that would be an excellent alt text for this if you posted it on Twitter. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> what's uh, what's the guy doing? What do you think? Concentrating. Concentrating. 
What's he like? He's sad. Old. Old, sad, somber. Small. <laughs> Here, let's, let's get a bigger one. What do you think about this painting? Hmm? Devout? Okay. Like the ghost story uh, flashlight sinister? Or? Yeah, the light, with the lights coming from the book. A little bit surprised or moved by something she's reading. Looks like she's trying to understand. She's trying to understand. Huh. So think back to any answer you gave or, or were thinking but didn't say. And which part of the painting was it that told you that? Could you be more specific? Face is very general. Oh, they're lifted a little, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. She's got a firm, firm hold on that book. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah. What did she just figure out? So Rembrandt's saying something with this painting. I mean, one of the things he's saying is, what does this woman look like? So if this is a real woman, now you know how big her nose is. But this isn't, you know, a, like, a mugshot from the police station in the Netherlands or something. There's something else besides just what is her, what's her physiognomy here. Now, in terms of where art's going today, I want to put this chart up. So this is, uh, this is movies, movies that do well. And the, and the years go from 78 to 2019. In red, oh. <laughs> You're right, it could have been. I should have gone with that. And someone said, wait, that, that's a graph. Okay. So the red is, so the, you know, the total vertical size is all the movies made that year. The red is new, actual, original movies. The blue is sequels. Original movies are decreasing in number and reboots, sequels, remakes are going up. Now this one, don't say it out loud. This one I just wanted you to look at, but don't say it out loud. One of these is a reboot. But don't say it. Don't say it. Just take a look. One of these is Rembrandt and one of these is Microsoft. They're both act, they're both paint. So some of the, if, like the physical side of things, if you can see it, one looks a little 3D. Anyway, it's just, it's, I just want to let you know that these are both actual paints, paintings on canvas framed in the real world photographed here. Just to avoid any suggestion by position, just flipping them just to. They're both paint. One of them was painted by a human being, Rembrandt. One of them was painted by a special 3D painting printer based on a design that Microsoft developed. Same two, I'm just flipping the order. <laughs> All right, let's do the reveal. I want you to, we each have two arms, so, you know. If, if this is the, let's say which one's the Rembrandt. So if this is Rembrandt or if this one's Rembrandt. Okay, so ready, set. Okay, put your arms up. Which one? Wow. Okay. Isn't that something? Well, these are both made by Microsoft. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding. no this, this is the real one. This is the real one on the left right now. <laughs> I did that once at one of these things. I got every table to do the life 
boat thing and figure who they would throw off of the lifeboat. And every table actually did it. And I said, well, look, the point of this was to see who would say this is crap and we're not going to pick anybody. Everybody failed. So, yeah, this is the real one. And this is the one where it's a remix. It's like those Da Vinci things. It's pieces of other Rembrandt paintings reassembled to look like something that from a distance you'd say, oh, yeah, that's Rembrandt as opposed to, you know, that wasn't Da Vinci. That was Rembrandt. Huh. Literal. Okay. So when you have a thought, does that thought manifest itself only in your nose or only in your eyebrows? Or is it... Does a, does a thought or an emotion usually come out everywhere all at once? So with these, I, and I didn't do this, but I might be need to look like at just the one eye of each and see if we could tell which one's real or not. It would be a lot harder because then you don't have that. You get just like the remix of pieces thing where each piece is probably okay, but you put it together and, and you know, and then maybe not. So I want to talk uh, to come back to the most evil man of the 20th century, Bertrand Russell, and talk about how he not only wanted to kill most people, he wanted to kill creativity of most of the people that he didn't kill physically. That was his goal. So uh, here he is looking, looking the part. <laughs> Could I have someone please read this quote? If it's big enough. Kynan. Um, so nice socialism, especially international socialism, is only possible as a stable system if the population is stationary or nearly so. A slow increase might be coped with by any with by improvements in agricultural methods, but a rapid increase must, in the end, reduce the whole population to penury. Um, the white population of the world will soon cease to increase. The Asiatic races will be longer, and the Negro still longer, before their birth rate falls sufficiently to make their numbers stable without the without help of war and pestilence. Until that happens, the benefits aimed at by socialism can only be partially realized, and the less prolific races will have to defend themselves against the more prolific by methods which are disgusting, even if they are necessary. Now, sounds like a great guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sounds like it was written by a computer. Who's in this fight? <laughs> Who's he smoking? Right? <laughs> yeah, evil person. Well, his eyes look like the Microsoft version of the other painting. <laughs> so this was not a secret taped discussion among donors at an evil conference. This is a book he actually published. Okay, I want to do, uh, do one more on the... That was on the actual killing of people. This one's on killing the mind. It's three slides long, so who will do the honor? Thank you. <clears throat> the scientific rulers will provide one kind of education for ordinary men and women, and another for those who are to become holders of scientific power. Ordinary men and women will be expected to be docile, industrious, punctual, thoughtless, and contented. Of these qualities, probably contentment will be considered the most important. In order to produce it, all the researches of psychoanalysis, behaviorism, and biochemistry will be brought into play. All the boys and girls will learn from an early age to be what is called cooperative, i.e. to do exactly what everybody is doing. Initiative will be discouraged in these children, and insubordination without being punished will be scientifically trained out of them. Except for the one matter of loyalty to the world state and to their, own, uh, to their own order, members of the governing class will be encouraged to be adventurous and full of initiative. It will be recognized that it is their business to improve scientific technique and to keep the manual workers contented by means of continual new amusement. On those rare occasions when a boy or girl who has passed the age at which it is usual to determine social status shows such marked ability as to seem 
the intellectual equal of the rulers, a difficult situation will arise, requiring serious consideration. If the youth is content to abandon his previous associates and to throw in his lot wholeheartedly with the rulers, he may, after suitable tests, to be promoted. But if he shows any regrettable solidarity with his previous associates, the rulers will reluctantly conclude that there is nothing to be done with him except to send him to the lethal chamber before his ill-disciplined Ill intelligence has had time to spread revolt. That will be a painful duty to the rulers, but I think they will not shrink. <laughs> you probably thought about Moses there. Yes, that's what I was thinking. I was thinking the same thing. Wait, wait, <laughs> say more, please. No, no, uh, because like now if there's one that rise up, thing. he'd be part of the rulers. And oh. that's what you had with Moses. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. And he let his people out. Right. Okay, real charming guy. But now, <laughs> even worse than this is what he did to science. Well, maybe just also very evil. <laughs> Most people is what he did to science. So Lyndon LaRouche uh, has spoken a lot, <laughs> spoke a lot uh, about an event that occurred in Paris in 1900 at the International Congress of Mathematicians, where this man, who was just gardening, David Hilbert, <laughs> showed up and talked about a series of problems that he said would advance mathematics. He put out 10, later it was out of 23. I just want to mention two of them. One of them was about whether, in short, whether math could become a branch of logic. What, what does logic mean? Does anybody, or give an example, yes. Could you give an example of a logical deduction? C is equal to B, then A is e uh, C is equal to A. Okay. And then can you give an example where you apply a general rule like that, but then use some, some real world um, okay. terms? Um, I mean, you could be racist with this. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, no, 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 no. Okay. Any <laughs> example is fine. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay, I see a man who's wearing a red hat, and he stole my wallet. So uh, a man who's wearing the red hat is a thief, right. right? And then I see another man who's also wearing a red hat. These two, these are both men who are wearing red hats. Therefore, that man is also going to steal my wallet. Okay, so you, you've uh, you've made an induction that you've seen a lot of. You're very unfortunate, and you've had your wallet picked by several men wearing red hats, yeah. and you just assume uh, anyone wearing a red hat is probably a thief. That's very racist. And. <laughs> And hopefully you put your wallet in your front pocket after that. <laughs> yeah, okay, so that's induction. Um, would anyone else like to give one more example of a logical inference? I'm going to give one. Oh, yes. Sure. So, um, we, so let's say we have only seen white swans, right? We've seen a lot of swans, but they're all white. So we can conclude that all swans are white. But there actually are black swans. Isn't that a, a fallacy? Though? Is, is it, that a logical fallacy? Yeah, I guess it, it could be. Say more. Why, why, why is that a fallacy? Um, because if you've seen a lot of white swans, that doesn't mean you've seen every swan, so you can't make that leap. Right. So knowledge comes from gathering data. Is there ever enough data to firmly draw a conclusion? That's how you arrive at conclusions, and you'd have to say no. Yeah, so data doesn't arrive at conclusions. Here's one more. That's another induction. Um, let me give one example of a, of a logical deduction. Oh, that's fine. That's like coming up with a more general concept from what you observe. Let's do it the other way. So let's say that all birds can fly. A pigeon is a bird. Therefore, a pigeon can fly. So all A or B, all birds are flyers. C is an A. Pigeon is a bird, therefore C is a B. Basically the same thing as your first example. That's logic. So the thing about logic is what is logic talking about? Okay, so like mathematics, what's the subject of math? Let's go back. Um, let's say you're studying biology. What's the subject matter? What do you look at if you're studying biology? Life living things, bugs, 
pigeons. Okay. If you're studying math, what are you looking at? What are you actually studying? Death. Death. <laughs> <laughs> that was a flash of insight. Okay. <laughs> what else might you be studying in your math class? Numbers. Numbers. Shapes. Geometry. Okay. What are you studying in your logic class? How to kill people in a boat, reason, logic. You're studying logic. So logic as a field sort of explicitly disclaims the idea that it's studying anything. And it's only talking about how thoughts are allowed to relate to each other and rules for combining thoughts to make a new thought. Maybe thought is too generous. Combining sentences to make a new sentence. So the... Um, Could the Vulcans ever have gone to space? Just you think about that one. <laughs> and could the Klingons? Okay. Now, so, <laughs> all right, so this was, uh, this is one of the things Hilbert put up. He said, can we, can we figure out whether math is just logic? In other words, can just these A's, B, B's, C, can we do that and forget the numbers altogether? The other big thing he said is, can we do that with physics? Can we turn physics into logic? So this is what he, he posed as challenges. Here's what uh, LaRouche has to say about that. And um, this one's... Uh, I, is anyone up for reading this one? Daniel, please. Consequently, what David Hilbert had done from the closing moments of the 19th century onward was to put forward a claim. In a 1900 Paris address to the Congress of Mathematicians, Mathematicians, this was the occasion of the broad launching of his famous, but later essentially systemically failed attempts to produce a defense of what was the intrinsically pathological mathematical formalist's suppositions. The essential subsuming supposition was that experimental physical science could be, or even should be, superseded by what has been implicitly a merely neo-Euclidean form of mathematical axiomatization of physical science. The problem posed in this fashion was not merely that his formulation was bad, the problem is that his essential argument was intrinsically irrelevant, as being a proposition of a class of argument suited to a search for the correct choice of formula for breeding even sunspots from cucumbers. <laughs> the issue itself, which Hilbert posed, has little to do with his aptitudes as a formalist in mathematics as such. The real issue is one of physics, not mathematics. The real problem does not lie within the abstractions of his more formal mathematics as such, but in the incompetence of his choice of the subject, his adoption of a matter of mere mathematics used as a substitute for the practice of a competent physical chemistry. So, to the same effect, the real economic value is not measured in money, but in the effect of production and consumption combined on the relative increase or decrease of the physical productive powers of applied labor. The essential form of the issue so posed is the following. The reductionist mathematician insists that a proposed universal principle must be qualified mathematically. The physicist, on the contrary, warns that no physical principle can be asserted as having been demonstrated by any other means than the equivalent of a collision among two or more principal types of crucial experiment, as this is typified by Johannes Kepler's generation of the notion of a universal principle of gravitation from a collision between two qualities of sense perception, the evidence of sight versus the evidence of harmonics. Competent mathematics is created and subsumed by physics, such as the physics of 20th century physical chemistry of such followers of Bernard Riemann 
as Dmitry Mendeleev, Max Planck, William Draper Harkins, Albert Einstein, and academician uh, V. I. Vernatsky. The mathematicians such as Hilbert have written science bass backwards. <laughs> Therefore, it should be excessively clear on this account that it is not some calculation in Hilbert's formal mathematics itself, which was the source of his error, but rather the misguided reliance on mere mathematics. To attack his mathematics as such would be a rather silly mistake, since it was Hilbert's lack of regard for a competent physics, despite the warning delivered in both the opening two paragraphs, and concluding single sentence of Riemann's habilitation dissertation, in which Riemann located precisely the formal problem evaded by Hilbert and his positivist, positivist circles generally. Any reflections on that? That was a bit of a mouthful. Uh, Riemann sentences, this refers to, in 1854, Riemann, who was just amazing, he uh, was giving a lecture about the shape of space. And he opened it up by saying that we make assumptions about constructions in space, Euclidean geometry, for example, and we think we're talking about the constructions that you make in space, like drawing a circle with the compass, or drawing a line with the ruler, or using the compass and flipping it around to bisect a line, or something like that. Riemann says, okay, you're doing constructions, but you're also making an assumption about the space itself. And nobody, he said, you no one even realize that you're doing it, but everybody has been doing that. And he says, I need to bring that to the fore. You're making an assumption, for example, that space is flat. With the idea, for example, that if you have one line and a point not on that line, that you could actually have a parallel line. This is one of the postulates in, um, from Euclid, or a result of one of them. Here's a line that goes forever. Here's a point. Supposedly there's only one line, one way you could put this line, that would be parallel to the first one. What, is, what does parallel mean? Never. So do we go to never to, I mean, how do you check? <laughs> oh, that's where the assumption comes in, right? Well, because, I mean, say never interest, there's a lot of space going there. There's a whole universe out there. So it's a little bit bold, perhaps, to say that they'll never intersect. We don't know what goes on out there. For example, two people on the Earth. Here's the Earth. Let's say that, uh, we both start walking north. Are we walking parallel? Yeah. Will we never meet? We're going to meet at the North Pole. So, is the universe, are we actually on like a globe without realizing it? You have to know the shape of space, just like you have to know the size of the Earth to know, you know, when you're going to meet at the North Pole or something like that. So, what's the size of the universe? What's the shape of the universe? Riemann doesn't answer the question. He goes through, you know, how you would work out the... He works out how you can talk mathematically about curved spaces, which Kant thought was impossible. But then he ends it. He says, but you know what? I can't tell you the answer to all this. We're in the math department. You need to go to the physics department if you want to know the actual shape of space. You can't just imagine it. That's what... That's what Lynn's referring to here. Yeah. If I remember, I wrote that one of Lynn's Russian friends told us, if I can remember it right, there's a guy who um, is in a hot air balloon on a beautiful, beautiful sunny day, but the winds pick up and he's blown completely off course and he, he's over geography, he has no idea where he is. So uh, he's not in danger of falling, but he's like, no idea where he is. So he's you know, panicking. He looks down and he sees two guys walking. Um, and they happen to be mathematicians. Uh, there was a nearby math conference. And um, so they're walking, they see the guy, and the guy on the board yells down, 
where am I? And Matt, they just look at each other, and they say, you're in a balloon! <laughs> <laughs> so Hilbert's doing something similar to this, this geometric thing. So he's saying, just like Riemann was saying, to know the shape of space, you got to understand physical things that make processes unfold. He's saying to Hilbert, you can't turn all of physics into mathematics. Did you miss what Riemann already did? And then he, he also had that tie in there with money and economics, that math versus science, it's like money versus economy. There is money in an economy, but that's not where you don't, can't understand it that way. Like you can't understand science from math. Just one more thing on, on Hilbert here and set this up. Here's his idea about how you think about things. We must establish the correctness of the solution by means of a finite number of steps based on a finite number of hypotheses. This is simply the requirement of rigor in reasoning. Indeed, the requirement of rigor corresponds to a universal philosophical necessity of our understanding. Rigor. I'm thinking back to what you had said about the math department, and I'm thinking of rigor mortis now. <laughs> so is this where creativity comes from? A series of logical steps? No. So let's talk about what else was going on in 1900. So Hilbert makes this speech in Paris to the mathematicians. Meanwhile, Max Planck, Albert Einstein. What did Max Planck do in 1900? Does anybody know? What was he up to that year? He was studying black body radiation, which means when things get hot, they glow. So like a light bulb, the old ones, the filaments, they get hot and they glow. Uh, a stovetop might turn red because it's hot. People could not figure out exactly what kind of light would come out based on the temperature of a black body. They kept getting things that made no sense. Planck figured it out. I know this sounds thrilling. It was very important for the light bulb industry. But scientifically, what Planck said is that there is a quantum that light comes in pieces. So that for a certain color of light, you can't, you can't just turn it down dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. At a certain point, there are going to be individual pieces of light coming off of that very dim light bulb or whatever. Now, that, nobody thought that for a couple hundred years. Newton said light was in pieces, but people really showed it was a wave. And now here comes Planck saying, well, it's also a particle. This, even his answer is a conundrum or a paradox. When Planck came up with this, how many pieces, how many steps compose the idea that light comes in individual packets? Here's Planck's idea. Light emission is quantized. Light emission comes in individual pieces of light. You can't break up into smaller ones. And there's some words in it that you maybe have to make sure we get, but then overall it's really, it's one idea. It's not a thousand ideas that he got to by writing down 999 before it and slowly getting slightly better and better and better. Either lights in pieces or it isn't. That's a good point. I mean, it was around this time that people became really much more certain that atoms existed. That was still somewhat controversial, even among physics in 1900. So that's a good point. There's other ideas that sort of maybe help create the, the framework for him saying this about light. That's true. Um, I still think if you compared, you know, having a thousand ideas versus, you know, maybe this is a smaller number. Um, oh, I see. Like, if he just spits all the thousand hypotheses, it's like one of these has to be right. Well, the other thing is with that neural network, the hypotheses were quantitatively comparable. Like, it was just tw tweaking some numbers a little bit. 
So how do you, if light is a wave, do you adjust the wave and all of a sudden it turns into a ball? I mean, it's just, you don't get there by making mi small adjustments. It's a totally different idea. This was not a logical idea. This was not a rigorous idea. It was a creative idea. Einstein, 1905. This was called his miracle year. He wrote three astonishing papers. One was on the photoelectric effect, which is how light interacts with metals to kick out electrons. Um, this built on what Planck had done. That was an astonishing, that's what he got his Nobel Prize for later. He talked about Brownian motion, which is the motion of tiny little, whatever. It, it, it gave him a way of counting the number of atoms in like a, a glass of water to actually count the number of molecules and relativity. So what drove Einstein to figure out relativity? Does anybody have an idea of where that came from or would anyone like to describe what relativity means? actually perceive the world going around them as going slower um, in time. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a <laughs> there's a great YouTube video that kind of explains um, why this is the case. But uh, I think, yeah, that's, yeah that's, that's in a nutshell. It's one of the main points about relativity. Um, depending on how you move, distances also, the, like the, the size of space, and also the flow of time, the rate of flow of time, change depending on how fast you're moving. If you're going by very quickly and you watch a clock out the window, it's not going to look like it's moving at the right speed. And this was later tested really directly with bringing atomic clocks on airplanes and flying them around in different directions or different speeds, and Einstein was definitely right. Your speed changes the flow of time. Now, this was a huge shock. Because if there's anything that you take as a given, usually, it's the idea of space. That there's X and Y and Z, and space is just there, and there's things in space. Einstein, like Riemann, he's saying, not so fast. Space actually has characteristics. Time, this thing that just flows, Einstein says, no. There is not one time in the universe. That even means that the idea of two things happening at the same time is a meaningless statement. Because depending on how you're moving and versus someone else moving, you guys might disagree about whether two things happened at the same time. And you can't say who's right. So this was a this was a big shock. This was a huge and it, that's it's like as illogical as you can be. You did not arrive at this in a series of steps from space. And now you say, well hold on, actually space is is bent. Or you know it, it, it it's it's angled, it's tilted. Forget it. These were all, this was a non-logical, creative thought. It did not come from what already existed. It was not a slight adjustment to knobs and parameters. It's a totally new idea that comes really in just a sentence or two. It's one idea. So with all of this going on, let's talk about Bertrand Russell. While well, he's planning to execute everybody in lethal chambers, especially if they're Asiatic or Negroes, creepy, right? So, 1903. Russell wrote a math book, The Principles of Mathematics, after, named after his hero Isaac Newton. That was the name of Isaac Newton's book in Latin. This is after Planck has discovered the quantum. What is Einstein doing? I mean, what is, what is Russell trying to do? He's trying to do what Hilbert said. He's writing a book to try to turn math into logic, to say math isn't about numbers anymore, it's actually about nothing. <laughs> He spent a whole summer trying to write a paper about why nothing actually exists. And believe it or not, he felt very depressed at the end of it. That's the kind of man this is. Okay, after Einstein, in his miracle year, he spends three years with this guy named Whitehead, writing an even longer version of the book with a Latin title, the same goal, to turn math into logic. That's what he's working on. Science is being revolutionized around him, and he's working on logic. In 1931, Kurt Gödel proved that this was all a futile waste of time. Whitehead, who had worked with Russell, was a little bit pissed he had spent so much time on this book afterwards. 
Kurt Gödel, he proved, he said, look, no matter what you do, if you have a logical system, there are always going to be true things that are mathematically true that you can't prove logically. That there's something about human reason where you can know something's true even if you could not get to it logically, even in mathematics. Which meant Russell's whole approach was a waste of time. That what, Gödel, that what Hilbert proposed was a waste of time. That artificial intelligence will never happen. 1931. Already known. There are true things that cannot be arrived at logically. No matter what you do with the neural network, it's fundamentally a logical system. It's on a computer. 90 years ago. Okay. So, all right. <laughs> now I'm going to talk briefly about uh, what real creativity is through a few examples from Kepler. And we're going to look at how he not only didn't use curve fitting, but believed in the exact opposite. He was opposed to this machine learning improvement of a uh, parameters thing. So first off, when Kepler was in college, he posed to himself the question of why there are six planets. There's more, but without a telescope, there's six planets. Why are they these distances from each other in the sun instead of other ones? For example, Mars is about one and a half times as far from the sun as the Earth is on average. Why one and a half? Why not one and three quarters? Why not double? Why one and a half? Kepler had such confidence, hubris, chutzpah, whatever you want to call it, that he believed that he could try to figure out what God was thinking when he made the universe. And this was his first hypothesis on this. So it's a little, maybe I hope you can see it all right. Let's start from the outside and work our way in. This large sphere on the outside, that's Saturn's orbit. So Saturn is the planet that was known at the time that has the biggest orbit, farthest from the sun. If you took the size of that orbit and then spun it around to make a sphere out of it, that's what we're seeing here as, as a sphere. There's some thickness to the sphere because he knows Saturn changes how far it is from the sun a little bit. Within that sphere, we put a cube. The biggest cube, we grow the cube until it touches, you know, all of its vertices hit the, hit the sphere. And we put a sphere inside that cube, where the sphere hits the, you know, the faces on the cube. That sphere, its size, corresponds to the size of the orbit of Jupiter. Within Jupiter is this tetrahedron, this shape here. And within that is a sphere. It's the size of Mars's orbit. And then a dodecahedron, an icosahedron, and finally an octagon to get Mercury. Six planets, five very special shapes in between them. These are the only five shapes of their type that can possibly exist in space. They're called the platonic solids, regular solids. The cube, what is a cube made out of? If you look at it on the outside. Squares, how many squares come together at this point on the cube? How many come together here? Yeah, there's always three squares coming together. Inside is this pyramid. What's it made out of? Nothing but triangles. At this point, how many triangles come together? Always three. So no matter which side you look at these things from, they always look the same. That's what makes them regular. And these are the only five that exist. So Kepler is feeling pretty good about this because it matches up pretty well. It's not perfect, but it matches up pretty well. But the thing is, he says, well, the only trouble is nobody really knows what the orbits of the planets are. No one's ever done a really good job on this. So he, to figure out whether he's right about God's vision of the universe, says, I guess I have to totally reform all of astronomy and figure out exactly how all the planets move. Guided by trying to figure out God's mind. Wow. So. Here's, um, let me take a look at, at, let's take a look at what he did. So, oh. Great, okay. Mm -hmm. Oops. Uh-oh, don't look. <laughs> All right. Oh, hold on. Let's 
flat earth. People heard this idea of the earth's flat? Okay. Okay. That it what? At the post office. Okay. So, um... <laughs> okay. So, um, how many of you, how many of us in school measured whether the earth is curved or not? Did You did? I did. They had us do our Wow. That's a good school. Awesome. Could you say a little bit about how that worked out? <laughs> I remember doing it though, so I never felt well of it. Um, it had to do with measuring the shadows uh -huh. um, and distances between the shadows. Hmm. We did it, I think we did it with like, like yardsticks. Uh, I, you probably know better than well, let's just, I'm just going to leave it with that kind of hint to it. That, yeah, there's a way, you know, with, you maybe, did you, probably did it with another school? Well, I'll say you did it with another school. <laughs> or, because you had to compare your shadow to theirs. Uh, yeah. I don't know if it's a school, but we definitely oh, okay. Yeah, different places on the Earth, shadows are different at the, on the same day of the year. So, like, sometimes on the North Pole, there's no shadows, because it's dark all day, right? During the winter. So depending on where you are, shadows are at different lengths, and you can use this to just measure the size of the Earth. We could all do this in school. No one would have to wonder whether the Earth is flat. You could measure how big it is. How about the Earth moving? Does the Earth move? It does. How do we know the Earth moves? I've heard that too. Uh, how do we know that's true and not a, a, a conspiracy theory? Okay, so we're saying night and day. So how do we know the Earth moves? One of it's night and day, and then also the seasons um, at, during the year. Well, how did, do you know how, if you said the Earth didn't move, let's just say, can you think of another way to explain night and day? Well, maybe unscientifically. What's another explanation for why we have, why do we have night and day if the Earth isn't moving? Yeah, maybe the entire universe is just sitting around the Earth. Might be the sun's going around the Earth. Maybe the stars and the sun are going around the Earth. Oh, what's so funny about that? <laughs> okay. People said, you know, so a lot of, for a lot of people to say, well, the sun goes around the earth. I mean, use your common sense. Don't you see it every day? I mean, it's been moving, right? Last night it was nighttime. It said, I didn't feel the earth spinning. Did you? Yeah. Seems but pretty solid to me. Throw something in the air. It comes right back down. Okay, so the earth's spinning. You're saying the earth spins, right? Okay. Hold on. Okay. Now, shouldn't it have spun out from under me? Oh, at a slow rate it did. It's actually a pretty... Oh, I'm... All right, okay, all right. Well, one of the reasons that Ptolemy, who was one of the earlier astronomers, one of the reasons that he said that he knows the Earth doesn't move is because... Um... Nope, nope, nope. Okay, there we go. Oh. Okay. He said one of the reasons we know the Earth doesn't move is that like when birds go flying, the Earth doesn't spin out from under them. Things like that. So, okay, but so can anybody say wh how we do know that the Earth moves? Because the day and night thing, I don't know. I think I could say the sun's going around us. Also, please, let's, let's pretend there's no satellites. Like, let's go back a little bit in time. How do we know the Earth moves? I believe it's like, um, because if everything is spinning around us, like, why is it like at different speeds? Like, oh, the planets? Yeah, the planets and the stars. But the planets move at different speeds. They're different 
Thank you, Daniel. That's right. Up plus the stars, actually the stars, um, although they move at different speeds, they, their, their movement is totally consistent with them being on the inside of a sphere. Yeah, so they, the stars, they, they're just on a big ball that's around us and it spins. There you go! You get, you get smart people at the post office. Okay. Sometimes they go backwards. Yeah, well, who knows what's up with that? So I don't see how that proves anything, right? Okay. All right, so, so here's, um, here's how Ptolemy explained things. Here's the Earth. It doesn't move. Here's the sun. It goes around the Earth. It also crashes into Mars's orbit. My apologies. Here's Mars going around the Earth. Or actually, Mars goes on a circle around a circle that goes around kind of the earth. This is what this is what people said. Huh? Oh. <laughs> now I see why Lynn said suburbia was insanity. <laughs> Yeah, you can hop on that to go to work, huh? You'll get there tomorrow. <laughs> did, a, did a whole Twitter thing. I got in a whole Twitter fight with somebody explaining that. So. so here's how Ptolemy explained Mars going backwards. He said Mars moves on a circle on a circle. So sometimes as it's sort of passing, what we can do here in the lower right is we can watch the view from the Earth. So this is where Mars and the Sun look like when they're in the sky. And sometimes Mars goes backwards a little bit. Yeah. But that's how you explain it. Mars goes around an imaginary point. No problem. On a circle, it goes around an imaginary point that's near the Earth. All set. But the sun doesn't need one. Um, no, the sun doesn't need one. The sun's very special. It, yeah. What if you ask why does the sun go around that imaginary point? Because it does. <laughs> I told him he wouldn't have an answer for you. you just say. So now, here's, um, here's Copernicus. Have people heard of Copernicus? Said so that their sun is in the middle of everything? So here's him. He's got the Earth going around the sun. He's got Mars going around the sun. Except look at where the sun is. The Earth doesn't go around the sun. It goes around a point near the sun. Mars goes around this point, oh. which is on a line, not with the sun, but with the center of the Earth's orbit. Even for Copernicus, the center of the Earth's orbit was still the point that all the other planetary orbits connected to. The sun doesn't actually play any role in Copernicus. It just sits there. If it disappeared, the planets would keep moving the way they are anyway. There's spots in empty Nothing space, there. right? Yeah. So, um, what Kepler showed, he said, "Look, you know, arguing about this stuff is pretty pointless because Copernicus and Ptolemy—they're just—they're exactly the same thing. It's just like relativity. It's just a displacement. It's the exact same process. If you look at the relation among the Sun, Earth, and Mars, there's no difference between them. It's just where you draw the imaginary circles, and they're all imaginary anyway. So." Kepler says you actually can't decide who's right based on looking at which of these models is better because they're exactly the same thing. One thing Kepler did do, though, was to, you know, was to actually put the orbits around the sun itself instead of near the sun. But the main thing he did, <laughs> it's getting into a lot here, was to, um, okay, let me draw a picture. So here's Kepler, he's going to do something that's a lot like that neural network. When I describe what Kepler did, you're, it's actually basically identical to the way that neural network works. Here's what Kepler did. He said, here's his axioms that he started with. He said, Mars, okay, we have the sun. There is some line for Mars' orbit. Mars has a center for its orbit. And there's another point 
called an equant, where you can imagine something like a lighthouse turning around, or like the light thing at an airport. So it's spinning around. So these are, I'm trying to be like roughly, these are... So as this thing spins around, from one month to the next, it moves kind of slow here, and then it moves much faster here. So Mars moves way faster down here than it does up here, because what causes its, what measures its motion is this imaginary point with a lighthouse that turns at a constant angular speed and always points at Mars. Now how does that happen, physically? No reason. Kepler says, let's not worry about that. Let me just try to do what everybody's been doing and just do the best job possible. So what Kepler does is to, uh, is to take... <laughs> yeah. You know, this is going to be tough to explain, so I kind of won't. Except just to say that what he did was he kept adjusting his model until he finally got it so that the center of Mars's orbit, that black thing, comes into, there we go, comes into one spot in between the red sun and the blue equant. Basically, he said, Kepler says, I'm going to figure out the parameters to make this model work as, you know, the best possible. So Kepler figured out how far is it from the sun to the center of Mars's orbit? How far is it from the center of Mars's orbit to the equant? How big is Mars's orbit? compared to the orbit of the Earth. And then also how tilted is Mars's orbit, but these are the main things, these distances. When he did that, he had a model for Mars's motion that was better than anything anyone had ever done. Kepler had a mathematical model that fit that loss curve and the neural network would have been down almost to zero. It matched the data, the test data, better than anything anyone had ever done. When he compared it against his uh, verification data, it was fantastic. What did Kepler think about this? He was kind of happy about this, I think, that it worked so well, because it gave him a way to know where we would have seen Mars, other places, because there's only so many observations. Now he can sort of make up fake observations to work on his theory. But he thought that this whole idea was a bunch of crap. Why does Mars move on a circle instead of some other shape? How does this imaginary point cause it to move? Why does it move around in its center some other imaginary point? Why must these all be on a line? There's nothing physical here. So. When Kepler tested this out, he found an error of eight minutes. So there's 360 degrees in a circle. So you know, maybe a degree is about that big. Break that into 60 pieces, eight of them. That was the size of the error. Tiny error. The other people before him, they had errors 20, 30 times as large. They were off by that much. So if all he cared about was getting a neural network or getting a model that matched the data, he could have quit right there. But he said, that's not an idea. Astronomy has to be based on physics. So halfway through his book, when he's got this perfect thing, he junks it. He says, you know what I've proven? That if you try to understand things with math, it won't work. Because I just did a great job. I challenge you to do better than me. You can't, because I did a lot of work on this over years. This is the best possible model, and it still doesn't work. And then, not to even get into um, everything that he did after that, he, uh, well, he made a new astronomy. So he started from physics, and he had an idea about gravitation, and the planets being somewhat magnetic, and so is the sun, and this causes them to get closer and further. His physics wasn't all right, but he said that for us to understand the universe, we have to use ideas, a concept, a cause, a reason and not just say, if the numbers work out, if the formula works, that's good enough. What's the physical cause for that, for a formula? You know, what's the physics? What's the reality? And that's what Bertrand Russell 
said we got to scrap that entire approach. What Einstein had, did, had done, he wasn't driven by data. When he discovered relativity, when Planck figured out how light mo uh, came out, there was a real problem. What kind of light do hot things emit? Nobody could solve it. There was a paradox. Planck solved it. There was no paradox. There was no observed paradox that Einstein solved. The paradox is only in his mind. He said, what if I caught up with a light ray? What would that be like? And he realized, yeah, you can't. And he worked through that and he figured out that what that meant that space and time had to be totally different. So I think when we contrast the way machine learning works, the way it arrives at a gestalt-ish thing, if we contrast that with how unified an idea is for us, it's one thing. To get the machine learning to do a good job, you need neural networks with a million neurons. It's a million ideas, so to speak, a million numbers, as opposed to one thought. So I think the fact that, just to conclude with that then, that that contrast between the simplicity of a thought and the growing, enormous complexity of machine learning, I think serves to show how far apart the two are, and that what looks like progress in this direction actually gets you further and further and further away from what an idea is. And that's what makes it artificial. Is it time for questions now? Or... <laughs> may, I re may we return to what Lynn said this morning okay. about the pause at the end? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jose. Okay, Sorry, I was like saving all of these up because I think a cynic will tell you though you, you use the machine learning models in the beginning, and from my understanding, it's also they also turn into generations to our epochs, right? Like the first generation will yeah. run a thing, right? And then the second one will build off the first one and be like, okay, we didn't get to the objective. Let's try something a tiny bit different here. Yeah. Right? And so the cynic will say that isn't that kind of like generations of humanity over time? From the inception of humanity to today, we are building off of what has come before us because there's no way they could have figured out nuclear power plants in Socrates' time, could they? No, you're right. You're right. There's so, definitely a series of things. Mm -hmm. And just like 10,000 years from now, our, our understanding of physics should be radically different than what we assume it is today. Mm -hmm. Unless there is a way of knowing now what we can know 10,000 years in the future. Okay, maybe there is. I don't know. But, you know, I think you're... Well, Well, let me just bring in one other thing, and then let's make is is a uh, biological evolution, All right? Because what you described is is the standard way of understanding biological evolution. From generation to generation, from epoch to epoch, there's slight improvements that overall get things towards some um, goal. So you know these you know worms get better at living in mud instead of muck or something. You know, from generation to generation, they get a little bit better. That sounds similar to what you were you were bringing up. Yeah. But and, oh, and then just to add, so then I just thought it might be worth thinking about if there's any difference between biological evolution and human evolution. Well, human evolution is a little different because you have something that is unique to only human beings that no other organism has, which is the consciousness and the mind and the ability to understand the universe, right? But does understanding also evolve over time too. our understanding of what understanding even is do you know what i'm trying to say it does i just wonder even though the even though that word evolve 
might sound applicable to both, is it the same type of evolution? Yes, our thinking evol evolves sounds a little bit unconscious or unwillful. I think there's something a little bit more willful in the human, but you could say evolve in the sense that it, that's what people who said something they wish they didn't say some years ago. They say, oh, my thinking has evolved on this subject. Yeah. For example. In terms of all humans, but um, the neuron thing is on the case of an individual human, do individual people think like this, right? Because if you were to take the neuron and have the neurons represent a whole society, then what are the individual units of neurons? Is it people? Because then it doesn't make sense to have multiple layers of neurons and then these people over. So, um, like, that's not really how so, uh, human social interactions work. So. In this case, um, I think the scientists are specifically looking to try and find what an in how an individual human thinks. And an individual human, uh, you cannot necessarily model it using that. Although, actually, I would challenge that. I would say, um, if I can, I don't know, maybe if I can use the whiteboard, I can kind of show maybe how this works. Um, so, I guess for everyone, so let's say... Um, you are starting out uh, here, and then this is the next correct conclusion, right? So you start off here as not having an understanding, you see a new phenomenon. And then here, okay, well, how do, you do, how do I solve this? Okay, I'm going to try this method. Oh, wait, no, that's incorrect, right? Okay, I'm going to try multiple different methods. And then suddenly you find one, it's like, wait a second, that might work. I'm going to do some more experimentation. Oh, okay, we're getting closer to the truth. I'm going to find all the limits of this. And it's like, oh, I think I got it. And then you, you know, maybe work out a few other things, and then you got come to a new understanding. But the default is you're over here, right? And so once you're down here again, you go back up here because, of course, we never find the complete truth. You only find a, uh, a truth that's a little bit closer. To, but of course, there's always contradictions. Just like when, when Newton discovered gravity, he was, you know, correct. Uh, the gravitational model worked for a lot of things on Earth, but it doesn't work for everything in space. And then it was Einstein that came through and kind of changed the gravitational model. So in this case, maybe today we're in a different model. Uh, we're, in, we're in the you know Einsteinian model for gravity. Actually, now we also understand gravity as being waves. But maybe there's another understanding of gravity that we have in the future that we haven't gotten to yet. And we're just like over here. We're kind of just experimenting using little fluctuations and understanding. And just like the neurons. So like if you were to give those neurons an overly complex picture, they might just continuously run models and they'll never cohere uh, an idea until suddenly just by random chance one of the neurons um, find a pathway that actually is correct and it goes down and it forms the shape of the neurons that you see on the graph there. Yeah, yeah, so so, so they, they got they got over here, but yeah. they, this conclusion still like the ultimate truth is like infinitely down, right? Well, and you're just getting a little closer. You don't. I mean, we're back. We're back to the slide number five. Well, just a little bit of a difference in between the, the two. So, like in terms of, um, I wish I had another whiteboard, like another color marker, or just a different whiteboard altogether, actually, to try to really <laughs> do this. Is that, you know, so Kepler comes in with what the other guys had done. It has an error of up to one degree and a half. Pretty big error. He uses da, 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 he uses the real sun instead of the center of the Earth's orbit. Boom, it got better. He thinks, he has some lunch, works on some stuff, makes an you know, astrological forecast for the prince or what have you. And then he says, um, you know what? The center doesn't have to be exactly halfway in between the equant and the sun. One change that has a huge impact. Now, eventually, though, he says, you know what? This is getting a little bit closer. He makes some slight changes to how he accounts for the inclination above and below the, the plane of the ecliptic. Okay, boom, one thought, it gets better. But then he, he actually leaves this board altogether, I think, because he says, you know what? We're adjusting these parameters. Like, the equant, the speed of this, the size of that. But then he says, hold on, I think we need to just drop all of that thinking and do something totally different. I think that the speed of a planet is inversely proportional to its distance from the sun, 
because the sun isn't just at the middle of the solar system, it's actually making them move. So that relationship between your distance from the sun and your speed, that's not in the equon, it's not in the inclination, it's not in the eccentricities, it's not, it's not in anything anybody was trying to adjust before, and it's not even a parameter at all. It's a new way to say, hey, we need to completely throw away that entire thing and start a new model that doesn't use any of those parameters, actually. So just to... And that takes up the question of cause. It lives in a different kind of world. Here's another example. I just to, to say one more about the, a different... Could you say that incorrect uh, model that, that was closer, that would be in math what you would call a local minima, but not a global minima? Yeah, yeah. And, and the way he made it really was just like the neural network. He, he, he saw how adjusting each of the parameters, which direction would make the result better, and then he would adjust them all a tiny bit in that direction, and then he'd keep seeing which way should I adjust them to get a little bit better. It was like almost a perfect exactly like that neural network does. He, he minimized the error. You could call it that. So that's the thing. That's another thing that comes up in evolution. You say, you know, a local minimum or like, here's as good as I can get without doing something totally different. Um, so here's, let me say one thing about light. Okay. So when light bounces off a mirror, it has the same angle that it hits the mirror at and bounces off at. In Greece, there was an explanation for this, that for light to get from where it started to where it wound up to, you know, your eye, of all the places on the mirror it could have bounced, this is the one where the total distance that light traveled was the shortest. Light took a path of least distance. When people were trying to understand what light does when it goes into water, though, light bends. Daniel pointed this out. It's not taking, I think, not taking the shortest, no, Megan. okay. Megan, it's not taking the shortest path. This is water. Light could have gone from here to here and got to where it ended up in the shortest distance. Pierre Fermat said light doesn't move instantly. That was a shock. It takes time. And that the total time for light to travel is minimized. Think about how different that explanation is. Light takes the least time. How different is that from what you may have learned in physics class if you took some optics, where you would have been told this, that this angle, the angle of, oh, that's bad, whatever, the angle of incidence, and then over here, the angle of ref refraction, that you would have been told that the sign of this angle is always four thirds as big as the sign of this angle for light going from air into water. That's a measurement of what you observe, right? Angles and signs and all of that. How different is that explanation than saying light took the least time? One of them is about observations, observables, the sensorium. The other one is definitely feels much more like a cause and something more about how God made the universe, so to speak. Well, it's, it's sort of like uh, the difference between the, the two approaches is that some people are neural networks and some people start off by asserting something instead of taking something that's true and trying to make it more true they say something that is not true and then they prove it later through through just working on it right so because somebody has said recently they've theorized that because of all of these AIs that people have that, that make the, the fake paintings, they've gone looking through at older paintings from fresh impre French Impressionists before computers were invented, and they've realized that they've actually had neural networks back then making the paintings because they're kind of similarly uh, unhuman looking paintings. <laughs> so going back all the way, you can see a whole bunch of these these people who were working on paintings and math were, were neural networks before we even knew about it. Well, the people were just I, I doubt they were actually using what would today be called a neural network, but it, it has a similar appearance. <laughs> yeah. Well, the neural network, it, it copies the brain of somebody who's a little bit lazier. <laughs> Perfectly. <laughs> well, what happened was eyeglasses were out of fashion. 
And that's oh. what led to impression. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> see, no one could see anyway, it didn't matter. Uh, Daniel Kynan. He's, he's making a plot. He's referencing something that yeah. is relevant. But anyway, um, well, I want to I wanna say that I think that this goes to a crucial thing for people to investigate, which is um, the development of man from, uh, from a previous form of life. Because LaRouche wrote a lot about the fallacy of Engel's conception of, as recently as 2006, he wrote a major paper about the fallacy that was with strong reference to the, the fallacy of, of Engel's conception, which I've read the paper recently on the ascent from the ape to man, and he says that it is because of labor, in other words, repeated actions, that the ape hand becomes, which is incapable of using tools, he says, uh, or I, I believe that's how he puts it, becomes the human hand, which is capable. That there's a matter that it's the provenance of everything is labor. He begins the whole thing by saying, the source of all value is labor, and then he, uh, he attempts to demonstrate that that, or to theorize at least, that that is the source of the development of man from an ape. That sounds like a neural network to me. Uh, at least, you know, like the, the repetition of the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, perhaps at an increasing, uh, incrementally increasing, you know, Maybe capability. Maybe incrementalism is a, Say again? Maybe incrementalism is a better generalization. You're right. Okay. It's not, it's not the same thing exactly, but this, this principle, this, this concept which is embedded in neural networks of incrementalism, that, um, and that at some point you reach the the human capability, um, which I don't think that he means human creativity. I don't think that he's, you know, identifying that. Uh, but certainly he's trying to say that this is the ability of man to be productive and be increasingly productive comes from this repetitive, repetitive action associated with the opposable thumb. So I wanted to see if you have, um, you know, response to that or thought about it. Well, let's come back to, let's look at that evolution and again think about the difference between biological and human evolution. Um, so, so let me know if this gets at it. Or not. Sure. So, the Darwinian idea of evolution is that small changes get inherited, and if you're now better at whatever you're trying to do as a bug, you will have more kids because you're more fit for having offspring, and that that's what will come to dominate. So, over time, over by evolutionary time, life gets more diversity, finds more niches, develops new what seem to be technologies, but that it all comes through small changes that make you just a little bit better, and that that's enough to make all the changes that we've seen. You know, human evolution occurs in leaps. There is, from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age, there isn't like the, you know, Bronze point three age, point four, and all, there's just like a total, there's like a shift, you know, you have electricity as a discovery, or you don't. That's just a ship. You don't kind of have electricity as a concept. You know, once you figured it out, that's something that's just totally new. So, for human economic evolution, it's more akin to adding a new dimension than it is to making progress within one. It's almost like if you were stuck on a two-dimensional thing here, and now you can soar above it all. That's what it's like to get a new principle. So, yeah, it's very different from getting better than that domain. Do you want to respond to that? No, I think that makes, I mean, I, I think that that's clearly representative because in the same sense that what we're discussing is the, is the insight that leads to a new discovery cannot come from a deductive logical process then how could it be that the capability to make the new discovery came from a, you know, a sort of a incremental uh, process? I, I do just want to say also, I mean, there are things that machine learning is going to figure out, so to speak, that are going to be very helpful. I didn't really need to say that, but I acknowledge that while saying it's different than creativity. We'll put that in the unnecessary comments category. Uh, I wonder if you have thought about the following. 
talked about, I mean, Megan mentioned it yesterday, uh, the urging people to listen to classical music, classical art in, in the school and so forth. But it can also be bad, it can be bad performance, it can be badly done and so forth. And I have thought for years now, and I wonder if you have any uh, thoughts about that, but when it comes to paintings and music, the, the very soul goes out of the... Well, we saw it there uh, with the Rembrandt, but if, for example, you have... That's why I mentioned the, stro the, stro uh, the stroke in it, because if you think about Chinese paintings, very much emphasis in the stroke. Or if you have singing with actually... Uh, the idea is also in the voice and in, in the movement of the voice. And that is getting all gets chopped away when it's digitalized. It is like you're listening to a record and then you listen to a CD and it's like it's not the same, the whole soul is gone. The same with paintings. I sat with a supercomputer guy to help me to get Chinese paintings into it so I could show them on computers. We had to give up because all these little, little squares, all these little pixels. Mm -hmm. But the whole movement of the stroke disappeared. So, yeah. The question, have you thought about because classical art is so essential for now and for the future. So it is a thing, like Helga also said today, you have to dive into classical art. But most of what young people get is through the computer. Uh, so have you thought about that? Any yeah, let's well, think of some of those different. I mean, sometimes there's. I mean, there's no replacement that I know of, unless we make much better reproductions for actually seeing the real paintings. I mean, let's talk about some of the differences between live music and recordings, and then also live art work versus an image. Well, one thing with a painting is, you know, it's in a room. You're seeing it with other people usually, unless you it's in your castle. So that's just one <laughs> social thing about it. There's like an, you know a group concentration on it, which actually helps to look at it. But also, it's a th their paintings are three-dimensional. When you see it on the screen, it isn't. When you move around the room, it looks different because you know it actually sticks out. It has a sort of gleam in the light over here because of whatnot. So you just none of that actually gets captured when you're looking at it on the screen. Uh, it's it's. But it, for example, slides and slides and digitalized stuff is very different. The slides are much more. It's much, we could talk about painting. It's much more close than uh, digitalized. Oh, I see stuff. what you're saying. Well, yeah. I mean, at a certain point, I mean, to be frank, uh, I mean, screens have gotten to such intense resolution that because it used to be, yes, things that were, you know, print or slides or whatnot were much better looking than a screen. Um, but I mean, if you get like a 6K screen or something like that, the difference but, between but the stroke is gone you've so you've seen some extremely high-res screens yeah. and looked at yeah, them on that's it? what i got okay. but your claim is that a slide projector that it feels like it's more alive it's than better. That? Yeah, it's better. the other thing is with um and then comes the music too with audio i mean the other thing is just not using recordings i mean is that when you're again when you're hearing it something live in a concert you're with a group of people mm -hmm. the conductor, the performers, they do play off the audience, even though you're not supposed to be making a lot of noise, and you're, it's not just waiting for the coughing to stop, but like, you, there is, mm -hmm. something happens when you're in a room doing that, and then also it's, you know, you move your head, it sounds a little bit different, you know, you, the, the sound is coming from different places, when you turn your head, based on the shape of your ears, it actually sounds a little bit different, like none of that comes across um, when you turn it into just, even stereo, just two things on your ears. But you're hearing the strings versus hearing a wobbling well, speaker. I mean, the physical process of what... And your being there impacts yeah. what you but, hear. But even, like, that's the optimal to go to a theater yeah. every night, like Hans like, Christian Anderson did. But I have, I have recordings from records, and then I have with the same artists, the same year, the whole thing, and then I have CDs. And it's like, it's not even a shadow of the same thing. They might do some cleanup too. That might be part of it. Is yeah. it when they when they switch up the yeah. CDs, they yeah. might they might screw it up yeah. along the way too. I mean, one thing is you can definitely tell the difference between 
compressed audio, like MP3s versus like a real CD or so wave or play. Live music. Huh? Live I, music. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if it's really good, don't listen to an MP3. Get a get a proper higher bit rate recording. I mean, that's yeah. cool. Uh, Jason. Yes. Um, a while ago, I read uh, an article which was by Nicholas Acuza, uh, him responding to a bunch of mathematicians trying to measure a circle by, because they had already figured out how to measure a triangle, trying to fit as many triangles as possible into a circle mm -hmm. and measuring each of the triangles. That sort of set the way he was describing it that they just kept adding more triangles to the edges of the other triangles to fill in the blank space of the circle, but they were always uh, needing to add more triangles forever. Sort of reminded me of what you said with the neural network eventually trying to figure out what color something is. Would it be possible for a neural network to realize that it was futile, a futile effort, or to, to try and find a, a better formula to measure something? Let's, uh, perfect question. Uh, let's talk about uh, how we, what is the best way we can describe a circle? Okay. So, well, I was, I was keeping on, on the topic of the, the neural networks. You know, no, you exactly. You don't have to go to circles just because just I brought it up if you don't want to. No, I wanted to anyway. Okay. And, no, and, and it, it's a great thing. So, okay, a circle. We want to figure out some things about, anyway, the circle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Perfect. There we go. So if we want to know the circumference of this circle or its area, we have some troubles. If we want to express that in terms of its diameter, we can. So, pi. So there's this number that we get we, that we end up writing, like, which I presume stands for perimeter, because you take the diameter times pi and you get the perimeter. It's just my guess, but um, and it's this number, three point one four one, you know, and so on. Anyway, whatever. You know, it goes on. There's just no way to write that. The, all the ways of writing that take forever. A neural network trying to arrive at this number would have to be infinitely big. Because no matter what you do to try to write down what pi is, if we try to write it with decimals, we're never correct. Right? That's why it goes on forever. If we try to write it and say, well, I'll tell you what, we'll make a algebra formula whose answer is pi. You can't do that either. That algebra formula has to have, be infinitely long. So the circle transcends straight lines. It's literally called a transcendental number because algebra can't comprehend it. It just goes beyond it altogether. Um, so just to compare what a neural network could do or approximation, you can get more and more of these digits, but Kuza said something totally different. He said, well, you know what? A circle, yes, we can understand it in terms of its area and we can try to get this proportion, but you know what? A circle has the most area with the least perimeter. How do you express that in terms of... It, it, again, it's just like that just becomes an idea as opposed to tweaks or parameters or numbers or quantifiable something. It's one thought. Um, I kind of forget what you said. Is that I said, would a neural network eventually realize it was going about it the wrong way? The way a person would oh. and give up? Or try and try it? Um, no. I think what it would do is, I mean, just in practice, what these things would do would be that they would say, hey, I'm close enough. I'll stop. Okay. When you when you set one of these things up, you would say, I want it to be at least this close, and once it's done, stop, because then I want to give you another problem. So that's what would happen. Calculators are sometimes smart enough to give up on problems. If you type certain things in calculators, it'll say <laughs> error. 
But that's um, R coded. That's not the calculator oh, is not. A, a person did that. Yeah. Oh wow. Calculators are all hard coded. There's no neural network. Yeah. Like okay. if you press four divided by zero, it just knows. Oh, can't divide by zero if someone ever types that right here. Well, that's the one everyone knows. But like I never <laughs> divide by zero, and I put a bunch of other stuff in it because I, I like to press the buttons when I was in school and, and we had free time. Um, so like the class wasn't over yet, so we, we still had the calculator, but we didn't have any more work to do. So I would press the buttons as many times as I want, and I would avoid dividing by zero, but I would still get errors sometimes. I don't know how I got it. Well, maybe it was, you had a closed parenthesis that didn't open or something? No, it was like error too, too big and stuff. You know? Oh. Well, I guess if you try to make it store a number that is bigger than it's able to store, it'll give you that. That's true. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so maybe an example of using a computer with a circle, you know, a pixelated circle versus a vector a circle, which actually creates shape. Oh, yeah, which is stored as the concept of a circle, as opposed to a raster image as dots. That's a good point. Jason. Yes. Well, actually, I know, did you want to ask a question? Because I know you had your question. Oh, on yeah. I just, had, like, I just had a comment about what you were doing with um, the principle of least time. I remember learning about it in physics. But, um, I was asking, I was referring to what he was doing with the principle of least time. You had written the angles on the board. I remember just learning about it. You know, we had like a reference table, and it had the formulas for everything. And one of them was calculating the angle of refraction, mm. and it was something like four over three times the angle of incidence. And that's the only way we learned about it. And we didn't actually learn like what was causing it to go in this direction because of least time, like you said. So it was just a comment I had. You don't learn these kinds of things, what's actually causing it. You're just learning these formulas. Right. Yeah. They, they taught us about the, the proof of the Earth being round in my class, but it was a, a very unsatisfying explanation because they had a globe in the classroom. So, so this is a globe and it's round and it spins and that's like the Earth. And that was, that was good enough for me, <laughs> but I realized that a lot of the, the scientists you were talking about probably wouldn't have been able to trust that. Well, Ptolemy would have said, but wouldn't we feel it moving, or he would have, you know. Yeah. I mean, because if, if you don't give the other side a shot, you know, like, was everyone before Copernicus so stupid that they had never thought of, like, a ball that spins? I mean, you know, it's like, I mean, you have to prove it. Yeah, I mean, to, like, to, to get these discoveries, to put yourself in the context of before they were made, you have to be like, okay, how did they explain things? I mean, it is stupid, the idea that everything's moving around the Earth. I mean, it's easy for us to say now, isn't it? But, anyway. uh, Jason, I just wanted to go back on what Lenny was talking about, about like, classical art, right? I think, you know, for me, when I first heard the first song about recording, I mean, I was moved to tears, especially after I understood what it was. You know, when it comes to like the classical visual art, especially you know Western classical art, Rembrandt's, mm -hmm. um, Jacques Louis David's, right? It's not necessarily in the painting where you find the meaning or what moves you, right? It's not exactly what you see uh, because a, a good painting represents motion in stillness, right? Or even that painting, um, I forget, because by Raphael, you know, with the uh, the hands, you know, where Adam is touching God, right? I remember I did a college essay on that that someone paid me to do, and I just said, you know, this represents how uh, close, <laughs> how how we are we are almost divine. That man is almost divine. Like that's how far our connection is from God. But then I was talking about it with a member of this organization. They said, actually, is that before or after Adam touches God's finger? Yeah. And that had made me think about it completely different. And he said, see, because you're looking at it from a photograph. If this was a photo, then yeah, what you said is valid. But actually, the painting is supposed to be motion. Hmm. So is it before or after they touch? So. Sounds like a gotcha, because unless you go and see the actual painting, you can't answer right. it, huh? I mean... What? You might not be able to answer. Well, if, I'm just pointing out that if the poison person said you can't tell from a picture, I guess you're kind of... No, I mean, like, if it was a photo of, of somebody, like, posing as Adam and somebody posing as God. Oh, okay. Right? And it was meant to just be that still moment, right? Then, you know, you can't tell. You, you wouldn't be able to get to the point that it's, you know, mm -hmm. supposed to be them either before or after touching, right? Be 
cheap as you would think it's distilled. And if they wanted to show that, then they would have like a video instead of, you know, them touching, right? But the painting kind of forces your mind to think in a subjunctive mood that it's they're going to touch or they already have touched. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's not in the painting, but rather with your mind. It's like between. Yeah, and, and it's partly the whole thing, too. Yeah. Like 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 the, the, the Rembrandt versus the, the fake Rembrandt. Like there's yeah. if you have a thought it might shape your whole countenance and personality and yeah. oh, do, we, we just, so one more thing on the if I on the on the just another thing about the fact that you are seeing something on a screen does introduce something else, which is that they're reflective, so you see the rest of the room in it, as opposed to getting to see the thing itself. Um, and the color space of the screen is lower than printed color. So you actually there is a there are colors that will not appear on your screen that you, you would get with printed. So that is that's, that's, I did not have that. <laughs> Time to wrap up. Okay, we'll wrap up. Thank you, Jason. You're welcome. <laughs> the pause. The pause. Pause. Ah. Yeah, Bella. There's yeah. the pause. There's also supposed to be a pause after the pause. <laughs>